Fasting and feasting is universal. You know, I talk to an anthropologist and archaeologist, it's universal. Food is matter, food is material, food is memory, food is emotion. Everyone has a relationship with food, both positive and negative. People will often have memories of their childhood that are related to food. There's a lot of anxiety around food as well, particularly as people grow up. We're anxious about the food that we waste. We're anxious about our bodies. We want to take people on a journey from the present back through these objects and actually make people, I think, challenge people quite a lot about what is my relationship to food? Why do I eat what I eat? Why do I eat when I do? With whom? At certain times, you can actually make people, maybe through the exhibition, reevaluate food and really have a transformative journey. One of the kind of problems of, of the Fitzwilliams collection and museum collections more generally in Britain is that they do reflect a particular kind of collecting taste and particular kind of culture, which privileges the Western, which privileges the Christian. Well, we're very, very keen to involve different voices. Why do you like this so much? Because it's from, from the, the uh, things from the old days. There's a, what looked remarkably like some kind of bovine creature on it, so I'm guessing it's a milk jug. But honestly, when you told me this was, you know, nearly 300 years old, I just couldn't believe it. This is to do with loss of food memory, because the food that she is preparing, we don't eat anymore, so we haven't got a clue what she's doing. And what she has just finished doing, she's showing really proudly, it's a hair that has been skinned and has been larded. But one thing I do remember, and I feel it so lovely, I used to go and see the chickens, and I, I called them different names sort of thing, and I'd, I'd lift her up and say, come on, Clara, I'll, I'm going to have to take it, and she'd look up like me like... <laughs> <laughs> we used to go to the farmer and get permission to glean his fields, and we used to glean and bring the, the wheat back, always in these lovely um, sacking sacks, and put them in the back bedroom, we used to feed the chickens, and we had eggs all the time. It was quite easy, really, for my family. We grew up in a small agricultural area, um, so everybody shared food. We all had allotments. Uh, if anyone had surplus, it was shared. If you didn't have meat, it didn't matter because something else would be used. This is a completely correct way of showing a trust bird in the late 18, 18th century. I think I would use this when I make my chicken soup in my up-to-date soup maker. When I sort of served it up, people would think that I'd actually made it. <laughs> Most of the time I eat everything that's on my plate because that's how I was brought up. That I had to because if I didn't, you didn't get any more. Well, you talked about your grandma, didn't you? We used to like go to her house and she always used to make the soup and then she used to put it in the pot and it just reminded me of that and like when I was little, hanging out with like my little cousins, it was like really nice. Fast and pray. It's got the word pray, so obviously it, it, it's definitely a religious thing and it's invoking somebody to pray to God and have the strength to carry on the fast. Fasting is using quite a lot of religions and in certain events like Eid. In my family, it's quite religious. Um, part of it is Catholic, part of it is Christian. It was kept as a sacred object. It had this kind of um, holiness about it that you, couldn't, you didn't quite dare chuck it in the bin in case something terrible happened to you um, because of that.
There is an idea that objects when they come to a museum are taken out of their social network, so out of their, you know, networks of love, emotion. So an object that might have had a special place in someone's sitting room or in a kitchen high up and that people knew that it had been a grandmother's or a mother's. And then they end up in these collections, they end up in those glass cases, and those stories are gone. So he says, I have profiteroles or cheesecake with your lunch. I eat them quickly because they taste nice. Which one will Chris go for? Which one is the red one? Which one's the fake one? <laughs> but actually, one of the things I think that we can do as, as curators is not so much necessarily revive that story, but to understand why people collected something like that. So like bring back some of the emotional resonance around it. We're hoping that although these objects are absolutely embedded in Christian traditions and Western European traditions. They will have a resonance for those people who are outside, so people don't feel excluded. I, I think I like this one most because I really like fruits. Because the pineapple is from like being in a country in a uh, Jamaica they see them up on the trees. But these again, these were made in England about 1760. This was a great elaborate ritual and tea was expensive and you took time over it and you had nothing but the best sort of tea wear. When I was little you could only get pied pineapples in the tins. I thought that's how they all they grew, they grew in the tins. <laughs> yeah, because that's how you got them. I'd never seen a, a, a real one. I would like my, one of my nans like 20 million teapots to be put in an exhibition. She loves teapots because even though they're just teapots, it still means a lot to my nan. So one of the things that's interesting about like what ends up in a museum, is we've got an object here, it's not so clear from the iconography, from what's around it, what it was inside of it. So one of the jobs that we have to do as, kind of, as historians is try and kind of reconstruct how this was used. They look like um, animals. So there are three hunting hounds chasing a hare. It's nothing to do with dogs and it's nothing to do with hares. Anyone can see Winnie the Pooh? Honey. Honey. Yes. It's a honey pot. And if you think about Winnie the Pooh and you think about those illustrations, actually the honey pot is pretty good. So this is the honey for the year and it had a lid on the top to keep out the bugs, keep out the dust. When do you cook and why do you cook? This is my version of stir from <laughs> And there's some kind of meals um, my mum used to make, which were quite similar to meals I would have in Madeira, and they were just kind of would remind me a lot of the place. And something that kind of comes to mind the most is mussels. That was something that we'd always have. On Christmas Eve, we like to have a big seafood feast. So we have all 18 of us around the table. We might have mussels, prawns, maybe the odd crab or lobster. We have a section of the show about medicine and food as medicine and certain types of food were thought to be medicinal, have properties that if you ground them up or you put them into kind of lotions and potions, they would help restore the body. Yes. Yeah, it's a feeding cup. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, it's a good idea, really. What's that one? A very bad accident when I was eight. They used to have those little things in the hospital because I couldn't eat. Also, once when I was ill, my mum phoned up the doctor and the doctor said, put him to bed and feed him a watermelon. So I, the, the whole day I just ate watermelon and ice cream, it was great. <laughs> Museums are not necessarily places where people feel comfortable, but actually getting them to touch an object, just getting them in the museum and like actually touching an object, which they understand is to be a precious object, but it's an object that's as much theirs as the museum's. My family come from an island called Madeira, and I remember seeing my grandma making a kind of like biscuit cake that was dipped in milk, and she'd like layer it up, and it was really good, and I remember trying it and loving it so much. She made it look really pretty and decorative, and added kind of lace. Um, to like kind of the plate that she had on it. That's what I want to, to do, to put my work in the museum so everyone can just look at my work. And we look after each other here, so we feel as though we're family, so eating together is quite nice. I like to sit with my family and just eat with them, because I want to eat with my family and to chat with them and talk with them. And the food is from Poland. My mum is Polish. We have it every day. 
It's tastier than English food um, and there's lots of choice. Out of all of these things on the plate, what is your very, very favourite Polish food? Everything. Everything! <laughs> <laughs> these objects are in the Fitzwilliam Museum, but they're there for the public benefit, the public enjoyment. They're no more mine than anybody else's. And we hope that in a way the exhibition it will really make people feel um, connected with these objects, um, make them challenge, make them think again about you know, why is the object in the museum? Why is it being selected for the show? What does it mean to me? And perhaps it will make people rethink similar objects when they go back to the museum or any other you know, collection gallery in the future. The quality, the originality, the, the, the visual power of these things, and when you then pick them up and when you actually have food and you've got the multi-sensory relationship, it actually makes these objects really, really powerful. And what I hope very much is that when people look at the recreations, they look at the context, they look at the labels, and they think about their own relationship with food, that actually this becomes deeply meaningful and they will go away transformed by challenging thoughts about food presentation, production.